Thank you very much for joining us today for WDT Mitchell's lecture, Art, Community and Resistance. My name is Daniel Carey and I'm director of the Moore Institute at the National University of Ireland, Galway. This is the second session with Professor Mitchell and we've had over 200 people signing up for these two events. Professor Mitchell's fascinating discussion of temporality yesterday engaged with many aspects of a dislocating year. The political dimension was among his concerns, and I very much look forward to today's lecture as a continuation of his meditation on the role of the arts in a moment of conflict and contestation. Today's talk, like yesterday's, forms part of uh, NUI Galway's contribution to Galway 2020, our year as European Capital of Culture. The university has generously funded a number of projects, including what was intended to be Professor Mitchell's in-person appearance here as a visiting fellow. Additional support has come from the College of Arts Research Support Scheme. I would like uh, to, to introduce our chair for today uh, and the driving force behind the event, Professor Paolo Bartoloni. He has led the way with the organizing committee, which consisted of myself, Nasser Cronin, Adrian Patterson, El Putnam, and Elizabeth Tilly. Paolo is established professor of Italian studies at NUI Galway and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Among his many publications are the books, Objects in Italian Life and Culture, Fiction, Migration, and Artificiality, Seperi di Scrivere, Svevo e Gliordini di la Coscienza di Teno, 2015, and On the Cultures of Exile, Translation and Writing, 2008. Paolo, thanks again once more for, for chairing today. Thank you, Dan. It's um, again uh, a pleasure to be here, welcome to you all, and uh, welcome to um, Professor Mitchell, and uh, uh, also special guest um, at today's lecture, uh, Janice Misrael uh, Mitchell, and uh, you'll understand uh, uh, why uh, we have uh, uh, the special guest here today in a moment. Um, but um, this, as, as Dan said, is uh, the second of uh, two events that um, we have been uh, working on for uh, a couple of years, as then uh, intimated. We started working on this uh, project uh, um, late in uh, mid, late 2019, um, with the idea of uh, hosting uh, a series of live in person events at uh, NUI uh, Galway in June 2020 uh, to coincide with the nomination of Galway as the European capital of, uh, uh, of culture. And then COVID-19 um, struck and we went into um, the uh, uh, remote uh, uh, mode. And here we are uh, today because we wanted to, um, to continue, we wanted to bring uh, these to fruition and uh, we do it uh, um, virtually, remotely, uh, with the hope that uh, in the future, the possibility and the chance of uh, um, hosting uh, Professor Mitchell in Galway in Ireland uh, will, uh, will become possible uh, when we start traveling again. Uh, also because uh, uh, Tom Mitchell has uh, some Irish uh, ancestry and he'd be uh, quite happy and looking forward to reconnect, uh, uh, although uh, this ancestry in, in Cork, uh, but uh, uh, you know, Galway is not too far from Cork. And uh, uh, so we, we are really looking forward to making this, uh, this happen. So uh, over the last uh, uh, two years, uh, several people have been uh, working on this project to make sure that um, it, it came to fruition. Uh, and I would like to thank all the uh, colleagues in the organizing committee, Dan has already mentioned um, uh, himself, Dan, Daniel Carey, uh, Hal Goodman, uh, Nessa Cronin, Elizabeth Tilly, and Adrian uh, Patterson. We had uh, uh, fabulous uh, discussions of the coffees uh, in the last uh, couple of years uh, leading to these events. So I'm very grateful to, to them. I'm grateful to the Moore Institute for hosting the events, to the two external respondents, Professor Jeanine Kraft, who was with us uh, um, yesterday, and, uh, and Associate Professor Timothy Stott, who is going to take the floor a little bit later, and I would like to thank them for accepting our invitation. Um, also, Enea Bianchi and Arianna Pagliara, uh, the designer of the uh, beautiful uh, poster, and David Kelly, who is in the background, making sure that technology is working fine and behaves, and of course, uh, uh, Professor 
double JT, Mitchell to stuck with us and is here uh, with us all today. So thanks very much to, uh, to Tom. Uh, as I said, uh, this is the second of uh, two events. The first uh, took place uh, uh, yesterday on the topic of present tense 2020 on the iconology of time. Um, the format of today's event is exactly the same as the one that we had uh, yesterday. Uh, Professor Mitchell will talk for about uh, 45 minutes his address will be then followed by two responses, after which there will be the possibility of uh, uh, asking uh, uh, questions, a Q&A session. Uh, so anytime during the, uh, the lecture, if you wish to make uh, or to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And also, perhaps once, uh, if the opportunity also arises uh, for you to come on board and actually talk, um, then please make sure that once you have addressed your question, you mute your, uh, your microphone. Um, I'm uh, truly delighted to welcome uh, Professor W.J.T. Mitchell. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, to listen to and dialogue to one of, with one of the leading experts in visual culture and the initiator of the pictorial turn. Uh, Professor Mitchell is Gaylord Donnelly, Distinguished Savvy Professor of English and Art History at the University of Chicago. He's the editor of the leading journal of cultural studies, Critical Inquiry, author of several books. I will mention only a few uh, today. Picture Theory in 1994, What Do Pictures Want, 2005, Image Science, 2015, and Mental Traveler, A Father, a Son, and a Journey to Schizophrenia in 2020. And editor of the groundbreaking volume on narrative in 1980. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment, for the Humanities and the American Philosophical Society. His books have been awarded several prizes, including the Gordon E. Lang uh, Prize and the Charles Rufus Murray Prize. I mean, books like uh, Picture Theory and What Do Pictures Want, I, I think made a, a substantial contribution to uh, the, uh, the study of visual art. For me, uh, in particular, I'm talking about personally here, uh, they really changed the way in which uh, um, I, 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 I deal with, with images. I mean, I'm coming from a humanist tradition based on um, classical thought. And, uh, and uh, for us back uh, then, um, um, vision was seen as a kind of neutral, uh, um, one of the most neutral sense, probably the, the, the neutral sense per excellence. And Aristotle thought the uh, sight is able to operate at the greatest distance from its objects of perception, for instance. So as opposed to the other senses, vision was considered neutral. Um, um, you see what you see. Um, that's, you, can, you cannot really alter that or manipulate that according to this particular view. Uh, for Renaissance scholars, for instance, our eyes cannot be deceived with respect to colors. Well, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, picture theory and what do pictures want have <laughs> really challenged that kind of neutrality indicating that uh, uh, images are not that kind of uh, um, naive. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to today's, uh, today's talk and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Janice Miserell Mitchell is also with us today because as probably you have noticed in the post that we added uh, a video um, with the uh, kind of cheeky hat or sneak preview. Uh, and Janice is the author of that video, Scat Rap Counterpoint. So I'm, I'm glad that she's here today to perhaps interact with Tom and talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, the video. Uh, so the title of today's lecture is Our Community and Resistance. Thank you all of you for joining us and to you, Tom. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Paolo Bartoloni for organizing uh, this uh, and for the uh, just the, the great honor of giving these, uh, these lectures. I hope someday we'll be able to do it in person. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I want to plunge into our topic for today. 
th this is going to be even less formal uh, th than yesterday's lecture. Uh, art, uh, community, and resistance. Um, I feel like everything I've ever written has in some sense been addressed to this topic, which in a strange paradoxical way made it even more difficult to come up with a unified lecture for you today. So this is going to be somewhat informal, very informal really. Uh, I am going to try to show you uh, to some extent my thinking uh, about the topic and encourage you to try to think along with me uh, because it's more about questions to my mind than it is about answers. Uh, just to begin with, think of these th three fundamental concepts we're trying to put together today, art, community, and resistance. Uh, each one of them has an enormous genealogy. Um, let me just say at the outset that I am not going to say a whole lot about the difference between art and non-art, because when it comes to communities and resistance, I think the, the notion of art for art's sake, it begins to fray. It's not uh, dominant. A lot of the art that we'll be talking about is street art. It is uh, instrumental art, poster art, propaganda, uh, that which Clement Greenberg would have completely dismissed as uh, not really art uh, in continuity with uh, the great artists of the past. So this may have a few great artists in it, but most of these are going to be unknown artists. Uh, and in fact, they're going to be a, a lot of them, a lot of different kinds of art. So then you get to community and community is an unbelievably complex concept. Uh, sociologists contrast communities and society. Maybe that's important. It won't be very important to me. Uh, I want to think about community and the commons, uh, the things that hold people together, but also the things that drive them apart. Uh, what makes communities split? Uh, and what is, how big is a community? What is the scale? Uh, is it uh, a neighborhood? I, I live in a community, a neighborhood that thinks of itself as a community. Uh, is it a city, uh, a part of a city, or is it an ethnic group? Um, say in Chicago, uh, much of Chicago, uh, the South Side was settled by the Irish, uh, and there are still relics of this, uh, but it is mainly an African-American community now. Uh, so how big can a community be? Is a nation a community? Benedict Anderson thought so. He, he wrote a book called Imagine Community in which he argued that the rise of the nation itself as a political form was what um, it, it became the foundation of modernity. Uh, in the ancient world, the nation uh, with governmentality, the state and so forth, uh, not so uh, evident. Monarchies, empires uh, often had simply genealogical structures, but a nation introduced the idea of a community of strangers. Uh, you are all Irish. Uh, in the United States, we are all Americans. And our nation had a historical origin. Everybody knows 1776, uh, although the first settlers with their slaves arrived in 1619. Uh, so is, is the community uh, the demos, the, uh, the collective of citizens? Is it, uh, and how far can we go with the idea of community? Does it include, for instance, uh, a phrase like the human community? Certainly humanists and humanism has always felt that there was something about our species uh, that required us to think of our species, not just as an animal group, but as a community. And in fact, of animal groups as communities. When birds of a feather flock together, we see that they coordinate their activities. They are a community of some kind. So our second term, community, uh, strikes me as uh, unbelievably complex, labile, flexible, 
And uh, I intend to exploit all of that and go from the very large, the global, to the very small, the local. In fact, my own little uh, struggle with power and my resistance to power uh, in my own neighborhood. Uh, I hope it won't seem too insular, but you'll have to bear with me. Then finally, resistance. Uh, Resistance, uh, I want to think about two, two ways of thinking about resistance. One is resistance to what? Of course, the kind of, I suppose for most of us, the normal answer would be, would be resistance perhaps to uh, the government, to authority, to the state, uh, to invasion by aliens. Uh, certainly the Trump administration was uh completely predicated on resistance to immigration uh we don't want uh brown people uh, we've got too many black people white folks only it was very clear about that there was no ambiguity so re resistance in some sense uh it, it's sometimes uttered as if it had a kind of automatic moral charge to it that because i'm part of the resistance that means makes me morally superior uh, rather than somebody who is passive and does not fight back. Uh, it, but I also want to remind us that resistance uh, in itself is just a counterforce to some kind of power. Uh, it, it can range from passive resistance, in which you refuse to go along. Uh, you sit down and you won't move. Certainly the civil rights movement in the US was characterized by that, uh, that refusal to move, uh, to sit in, to stay, uh, not by doing anything, not by, uh, except sitting still uh, and singing sometimes, we shall not be moved. Uh, sometimes it's simply saying no, just say no. Uh, so both passive and active forms, and it can be, uh, resistance can be on behalf of a good cause or a very bad cause. Uh, I think we've seen both uh, vividly. So as I started to try to organize this topic, I found myself looking through everything I've written and uh, I was shocked. It looks as if just about everything uh, bears on this, which makes it hard to organize it. Uh, if I were to show you my slide table right now, uh, and it was just what I gathered together in the last few weeks, let, well, let me just share it for a second. Uh, oh, it won't let me share it, damn it. Uh, it wants me to install a Zoom audio device. Um, very, very sorry. Um, this may be a problem today if I can't even sh uh, share my slides. Uh, let me try one more time. We, ha we had it there for a moment, uh, Tom. It was briefly there. You're, you're, yeah. Okay, now can you see it? But can I just get rid of this? Yeah. Okay, is that all right? Can you see 141 slides? Looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, if you could all just look at that uh for a half hour you'd see the whole thing uh it's uh far too much uh so i'm going to focus on a very few things and uh for this moment i want to introduce my wife janice miserell mitchell who is uh a member of our community uh an artist in several media performance music composition uh and she's also let me tell you a great resistor. She's a troublemaker of all kinds. Uh, I, I've been married to her for over 50 years, and uh, I know that for sure. So uh, I'm going to share a screen of uh, just the last minute or so of her uh, video, Scat Rap Counterpoint. Um, it's a video of uh, a kind of montage of actual performances in the streets of Chicago, woven with her own performance uh, as a street musician. And uh, it, you'll quickly see it involves invoking the practice of resistance, uh, but also maybe making fun of it a little bit, 
Uh, I'll leave it to her to tell you what, how to take this. Uh, it also documents the, the ubiquity of street performers and musicians uh, in our city, the city of Chicago. Uh, so let's hope that it will work. And I'm gonna go back to share screen. Okay, and here we go. So compose, propose, what goes from the page to the stage. Break it up, shake it up, find the beat in the streets. Don't just sit and need assistance. Come join up with the resistance. Come sing along with this gas song, this rap song, bus song, rap scat, and song attack, bob scat and rap attack, scatter rap, rap attack, 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 Okay, back uh, live uh, once again. Uh, Jan, you want to say anything? Okay, yeah, the video, which you might poss possibly have seen all of or maybe will in the future, is uh, kind of about the dilemma that a lot of artists find themselves in. And this is in particular a composer where um, you're thinking you want to express particular things, but you also feel the world is around you and you would like to try to incorporate some of those things, but you're not sure how. So this composer has two alter egos. And the composer writes very abstract music. She's sitting at the lake and she's writing what you might see as scribbles. It's you know a kind of graphic notation. And meanwhile, one alter ego is the hip chick who's just super cool and doesn't take this all that seriously. And she comes out from behind one of the sections of the Art Institute and starts uh, rapping in more of a jazz style. And then there's the revolutionary who has more of a hip hop style and is very angry. And both of these uh, personae um, have the same kind of uh, outfit on. They have black outfits with hats that tell you who they are. And the composer is a central figure trying to kind of incorporate, but maybe shy away from these two. Um, and these are somewhat comic, but the most comic are people who are outside. So there's a charlatan preacher. There's the church lady who's seeing we are uh, for the grist of the, of the Lord. We're, um, we are uh, going to be taken away by the Lord and, and uh, scattered to the winds. And then uh, there's a Bob Dylan creature whom I also impersonate and that's very satiric. And so these other, these are other voices that the composer is hearing in the outside world. There are also street musicians, a lot of people on North Michigan Avenue in Chicago. So the composer is the focus and then the two alter egos and then the world which is heavily satired, satirized. And this is sort of a clown world. And she's trying to figure out what is her place and what kind of art can she do given that this is the world and she would like to be relevant. Thanks, Jan. And I wanted to, uh... I tell you the entire uh, the link to the entire piece is available on the uh, the program for uh, the, this visit in Galway. So click on that; you'll get to see the entire eighteen minutes. And I think if you're persistent, ten, ten minutes, ten ten minutes, ten minutes. <laughs> and uh, you can also I, there must be a way to follow up Saturday Night Live, courtesy of Lena Dunham. Actually, did a parody uh, of this. Um, without acknowledging its source, but uh, it's out there somewhere. So uh, it, let me that now go to my uh, infinite slide lecture. Um, and you won't see me for a little while. Uh, OK. Uh, if you are sitting at home in your office, uh, taking notes at this moment, uh, I would like you to sh show you my notes preparatory to this whole thing. And this basically, it, my introduction a few minutes ago was basically drawn from this. I tried to figure out what these words, art, community, and resistance, to just map out 
three columns of associations. Uh, as you can see, art, finally, it, going through all of the things I could think of, comes down to media, uh, the use of media, and divided into images, texts, and sound or music, uh, the classic division uh, of the media into the, the sensory and semiotic uh, divisions. Uh, same thing with community, uh, the scale of community, uh, the neighborhood, the nation. Uh, and of course, I began to put in all of my specific sites, Cuba, Palestine, uh, Chicago, and the question of scale going all the way out to species and society and the demos, and then finally resistance. So this is just, those are the notes that underlie uh, what I was saying to you a few minutes ago. I would suggest if you have a piece of paper in front of you, make your own uh, triad. And toward the end of this lecture today in discussion, we can compare notes. Um, under resistance, I tried to think of all the words that ended in IVE about what resistance does. And, and of course, I think you'll immediately see that this is only a partial list. Uh, one of the most important is the commemorative, uh, that is the, the resistance to the loss of memory. Don't forget, uh, uh, black resistance in this country has especially uh, emphasized, say their names. As I was talking about George Floyd yesterday, the idea of remembrance uh, is crucial. There's also the constructive, what I call that, which not only constructs a work of art, but in doing so, attempts to construct a community. And uh, I hope I'll have time to get to the work of my colleague here, uh, Theaster Gates, who has basically developed an art practice that which involves architecture, building, uh, and the building of institutions uh, like the Arts Incubator uh, on Garfield Boulevard, uh, or the Arts Bank uh, on Stony Island. Then there's the subversive, uh, what I think of as the oppositional, but also uh, my favorite sorts are what you might call the sly. Uh, the understated, the, the form of resistance, which doesn't shout, but whispers, uh, and perhaps has more effect because of that. There is the performative, which you have just seen uh, in Janice's performance, uh, the demonstrative, and here I think of the art of the demonstration. One of my uh, uh, the colleagues here in Hyde Park uh, it talks about the art of the demonstration, about it not being just a gathering where you show up and somebody speaks. Uh, it has to be choreographed. Art has to be brought to it. And he said, who is the greatest performance artist of the 20th century? Answer is Martin Luther King, because he not only produced fabulous demonstrations, which immediately became TV spectacles, he managed to enlist the police as the extras in the drama that he had uh, uh, orchestrated. So uh, Bull Connor, his police dogs and his fire hoses um, became extras in Martin Luther King's movie. Then there is the investigative. Uh, and here I'm very interested in um, the work of uh, forensic architecture uh, Eil Weizmann in London, uh, who's, who does public art of a kind that is based in research. Uh, it is not just about showing something, but about finding something out, uh, making, uh, and, and in Weizmann's case, he of course has investigated all over the world, including in Chicago. One of his projects here uh, was the investigation of a police murder of a man named uh, Harith Augustus, not far from where we live, uh, a, 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 uh, an investigation that was covered up repeatedly. He has worked with um, local organizations here in Chicago uh, to investigate uh, police misbehavior uh, and police murders, which are routinely covered up and portrayed as uh, you know, necessary violence because the victim was uh, threatening the police. There's also 
let's call it the obstructive. I've already mentioned that. The, the sit down, the, uh, the sit in, the uh, placing your body in the way, uh, uh, blockading. And of course, these tactics can be used by anybody. One of the most obnoxious ones in America right now is in the South, abortion clinics are surrounded by protesters obstructing entrance. Pregnant women coming to get services can't get past people shouting obscenities at them. So obstruction, a double-edged sword, uh, sometimes uh, useful for a very good cause, sometimes not so much. Uh, and the others, protective, transformative, palliative. I'll get to examples of that. But the first one I want to talk about, oh, be before I get to that, let me just mention uh, the sites that I care about. Uh, I mean, there are many more. I, I, I visited Belfast some years ago and witnessed what a divided community looks like and the way the arts are mobilized on both sides with very strange effects. Falls Road uh, and uh, mural art. Uh, but I haven't been back to Ireland in, in too long, so I don't dare to really talk about it. It's not in this slide lecture. But I hope when I come next time, uh, you will introduce me to uh, the, the art of resistance in Ireland. The, but the places I'm interested in and have a long-term connection with, of course, Israel-Palestine uh, with artists on both sides. And one of the things that makes Israel-Palestine so interesting to me is that the resistance there uh, is generally against Israel. Sometimes it's against the Palestinian Authority, uh, rarely against Hamas, because it's very dangerous within Gaza to try to uh, engage in any kind of public demonstration against Hamas. That would be to take your life in your hands. But there's a lot of passive resistance, I think. And of course, periodically, Hamas uh, stirs up uh, the, the powerful Israeli military at the cost of the lives of scores of children in the most recent uh, you know, almost 200 people, uh, innocent civilians, uh, taken because of Hamas's unflinching resistance to the exi very existence of Israel. Uh, so I hope clear that I'm not um, trying to fetishize resistance as some kind of automatically uh, wonderful thing. Sometimes it can be extraordinarily unpleasant and immoral. The other site is Black America, uh, which uh, you know, I am not part of, but I am a friend of, I think. Uh, colleagues, uh, associates, old friends, and acquaintances. Uh, critical inquiry was always committed to this. And one of our great guest editors, Henry Louis Gates, right, uh, editing the issue Race, Writing, and Difference back in the 80s, uh, Identities in the 90s. And being a regular contributor has made uh, critical inquiry a, a very uh, important venue for the uh, publication of the scholarship that investigates the conditions of race in America and elsewhere. And then finally, Chicago, the South Side, where I live. Uh, so the first thing I want to look at is perhaps the simplest, and that is uh, the gesture, the gesture of resistance. Uh, perhaps, I mean, if we started with a minimal thing, it was simply this, raising the fist to say no, uh, or to say yes. I mean, it's not clear exactly what the raised fist says, except I am here, notice me, uh, I am standing against something. What they are facing here, and they uh, young Australian sprinter uh, is looking at the same thing, is the American flag, because the American flag is raised uh, as the uh, Olympic theme is played and the national anthem is played. So this is John Carlos and Tommy Smith, who won the gold medals in 1968. 1968, of course, is a uh, kind of magical uh, year in my life. Uh, I was 26 years old and part of the anti-war movement. Uh, 
this was a gesture that everyone in the anti-war movement adopted. It was also, uh, you remember, the, the year that uh, Martin Luther King was killed, a few months before this, he was assassinated. Um, it, it was a time of incredible uh, stress. Also the death of all my heroes in rock music, uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Janis Joplin. There was a lot to protest against. Well, this gesture was repeated and uh, when I come back, you'll see it's on my T-shirt today. This is my T-shirt. Uh, this is Colin Kaepernick, quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers, who took a knee during the national anthem uh, at the beginning of uh, a National Football League game uh, and raised his fist. It's an ambiguous gesture. It adds the knee to uh, the, the gesture of the raised fist. To me, it's one of the, it's a more complex uh, kind of signifier in that it, on the one hand, it signifies subjugation. On the other hand, uh, refusal of subjugation, rising up and kneeling down at the same time it was a really profound gesture. It cost Colin Kaepernick his career as a professional football player. Uh, he uh, was then boycotted uh, in an act of owner and big capital resistance to any uh, counter resistance. They banned him uh, from football. He's not been able to uh, find a job, even though the Chicago Bears could certainly use him. He uh, is a, quite a good quarterback. Uh, so the same gesture, and this is again, one of my points, recently used um, by a US Senator named Josh Hawley. Uh, Josh Hawley is a kind of proto-fascist from the state of Missouri, uh, a young rising star in the alt-right movement. Uh, he is, uh, this fist was being raised on January 6th, 2021, just a few months ago. And it was raised, what he's looking at, raising his fist is this, the, the gathering crowd of demonstrators carrying Confederate flags, the lost cause of the Confederacy, which has never gone away in uh, the United States, which poured into uh, the US Capitol, uh, threatened the lives uh, of Congress people, uh, and included the, the QAnon conspiracy, which believes uh, and makes very visible its protests that uh, the uh, elite of the United States, uh, Hillary Clinton, led by Hillary Clinton and George Soros, are uh, child cannibals who drink the blood of infants uh, and uh, have a chop shop for babies in, in a pizzeria in Washington. These people now constitute about 15% of the American population. Extremely alarming statistic. And it did not start yesterday. It has its own genealogy going back to the Tea Party. You may remember uh, around the, the turn of the decade, 2010, 11, uh, 12, the uh, Tea Party movement uh, rose up as a kind of reenactment of the American Revolution uh, and uh, characterized it by the, the threat of an insurrection arising uh, that would uh, not just defend the Second Amendment uh, with words, but with the things guaranteed by the Second Amendment, namely guns. Uh, this was the Tea Party's warning uh, in 2011. Uh, the, this was their uh, threat to Barack Obama. It's time to water the Tree of Liberty, and the Tree of Liberty gets watered with blood, with the blood of, by their lights, the tyrant known as Barack Obama. Uh, Charlton Heston, a frequent hero with his uh, remark in the Michael Moore movie uh, about the Second Amendment, uh, Heston said, yes, they can take my guns from my cold dead hands. Uh, so that is what you might call the bl most blatant use of the arts of resistance uh, by the right wing in this country, uh, a continuing threat, which has not gone away since January 6th. 
Okay, I want to talk about one other form of resistance that may be internal to the arts. Uh, what happens when a people is portrayed, a community is portrayed as something, uh, often in denigrating or stereotypical images? Barbara Kruger, uh, one of my favorite conceptual artists, uh, reflected on this practice in her great piece, Help, I'm Locked Inside This Picture. How do people get locked inside of a stereotype or a picture, and how do they resist it? Uh, this is not the kind of demagoguery or mass movement sort of protest. It's much more subtle, and I think not to be ignored. Here is Glenn Ligon's wonderful answer uh, to Barbara Kruger. Uh, as you can see, these are identical portraits of Ligon, but one of them is captioned uh, self-portrait, exaggerating my black features. The other one is self-portrait, exaggerating my white features. What I think this picture is suggesting is that white and black are not simply out there in the world. Uh, they are in you. They are part of your perceptual apparatus. And this is, uh, is something that uh, you are projecting onto the image. It's as if the image is not merely out there, but inside your head. So uh, on that same line, Chicago, uh, home to an unbelievable number of uh, wall murals of this sort, uh, about community, pride, the love of community, and the resistance of community uh, to destruction. Uh, the south side of Chicago, where we live, uh, the, in the Washington Park area, just to the west of us, uh, the population has been cut in half. It's uh, urban renewal produced uh, a product called black removal. So the population has diminished uh, by 50% over the last 20 years. Uh, there is resistance everywhere and the best documentation of it is my former student, Rebecca Zorak, who I want to recommend her book. If this is the kind of uh, interest you have in the art of resistance in, in community, you can't uh, do better than Rebecca's book. Then my other uh, kind of second country that I love. And by the way, I love Israel as well. I've been going there since 1968 uh, and learning something new every time. But here's uh, what you might call a protest map. This shows the Palestinian loss of land, 1946 to 2000. One of the things that communities experience is removal. Uh, and this is still going on. The tiny little patches of green uh, they haven't been diminished enough. As you may know, uh, the recent troubles uh, in Israel-Palestine were caused because uh, in the tiny residual enclaves of Palestinians in Jerusalem, you see that, that green dot there, that's Jerusalem. The main concentration is in the north around Ramallah up to, to Nablus. Uh, so Ramallah is the great island of Palestinian uh, urban culture now. In Jerusalem, there are tiny things. It's too much. They have to be removed. And that's what sets off the, uh, every intifada, is that moment of trying to completely erase a community, which refuses to go away. And how do they express that refusal? Here's one of my favorite. It's not a big deal. It's not a uh, huge demonstration with thousands of people. It's a stamp. Uh, this is in my passport. Um, if I were to try to use this passport uh, at, the, um, at a checkpoint in Israel, I probably would be denied entry into the country because uh, Khaled Girard, the artist, uh, carved out by hand a rubber stamp of the state of Palestine uh, with a dove of peace and the olive branch. Uh, as its symbols, a state that does not exist. It's aspirational, uh, it's utopian. Uh, and a, a great story about this as part of performance, uh, Khaled uh, spent a couple of years 
uh, just standing at the bus station in Ramallah when Palestinians, usually from America or Europe, would come. This is part of the diasporic community. And uh, he would offer to stamp their passports as they got off the bus. Uh, one day he did this with a Palestinian family, a, a father, mother, and a teenage boy. And immediately it split the family uh, down the middle. The teenage boy said, damn right, I want that stamp. And his mother said, don't you dare, if you have that stamp in your, your passport, we're gonna get in trouble when we pass through the Israeli checkpoints. Uh, the son said, oh, mom, come on. Uh, it's not such a big deal. And he <laughs> handed it over. She was shocked. And then she turned to her husband and said, well, now don't you do it. And <laughs> the husband torn between his wife and his son handed his passport over to Khaled uh, to get the stamp as well. Whether they got in trouble for that, I don't know. Uh, while I'm mentioning Khaled Jarrar, I would re recommend this video, which I wish I could show to you. It <clears throat> shows you how you go, how the community of Palestinians goes from Ramallah to Jerusalem when they haven't got a permit. They go through the sewers. It's a 10 minute, uh, what he calls a journey of light, the journey 110, because it's 110 meters through sewers that will take you to the other side of the checkpoint that at Kandalia that uh, prevents movement from one place to another. Then of course, uh, there has to be a support for uh, uh, the art of resistance and what better support than a security wall, uh, a, a wall that keeps a community from moving, that hems it in like an open air prison as in Gaza or uh, keeps it from uh, communicating with its neighbors, splits the community into the diasporic, the residential, occupied, and then uh, the Palestinians who live inside Israel as second-class citizens. Uh, here's what a group of Mexican muralists did. They showed uh, an image of uprising uh, with, uh, and this is John Berger and his uh, granddaughter walking by the wall. I'm not gonna go into the specific iconography, but it's about a, a fighter wearing a keffiyeh and bursting up out of the ground uh, among the, the trees of an olive grove. But there is in some sense, the degree zero of uh, community and resistance. To exist is to resist. This is a different kind of Cartesian cogito. I resist, therefore I am. Banksy has also been uh, into the game. International artists come. And of course, a hole in the wall uh, uh, showing the beach is a kind of instantiation of a dream of Palestinians locked in the West Bank. It, uh, Palestine is a landlocked nation artificially. It's on the Mediterranean, but uh, Gaza cannot send its boats out without uh, great danger and interference. Uh, on the other side, this is a view of a security wall from the Israeli point of view. Uh, it's a photograph by Mickey Kratzman. It's a place I visited myself and re-photographed, but Mickey did the best photograph of it. Uh, what he showed was the Israelis did not want the Palestinian village. Uh, this is uh, a Palestinian village across the valley. It's Beit Jala, and we're in the village of Gilo here. So the Israelis had some Russian realist painters, socialist realist painters who had arrived, who were immigrants, and commissioned them to paint a trompe l'oeil landscape uh, that would make the wall seem to disappear. Doesn't do a very good job of it, but you see what the idea is. And uh, a, a student whose master's thesis uh, I supervised in Israel wrote about this uh, project, talked about how the Russian artists felt about it, because one of them said, you know, I thought we escaped this kind of crap when we left Russia. And here we are in the land of uh, a democracy like Israel, and we're commissioned to do this sort of propaganda, uh, to cover up the wall. Finally, uh, I, I mentioned investigative 
art, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, uh, a, a Lebanese Palestinian artist, has created uh, shooting galleries. Uh, you can see these these are targets which can come on a pulley, uh, but they are uh, it's an acoustic shooting gallery which allows you to distinguish between rubber bullets and uh, lethal bullets. Uh, of course, rubber bullets can do great damage. They can kill you just as, as easily as lead bullets. Uh, but um, Abu Hamdan wanted to do this and he took recordings which tried to exonerate uh, Israeli security guards from charges of murder uh, by uh, analyzing the acoustic imprint um, of a rubber bullet uh, and a, uh, a lead bullet. Uh, so a kind of uh, a forensics of which there is a great deal. Um, there's also simply the going out and photographing uh, what has disappeared. Uh, this is, there's a Bedouin village in the Negev desert that has now been bulldozed and destroyed a hundred times minimum. Uh, here it is as a, in a kite photo, uh, you can't fly a drone or the Israeli security will intercept you. But if you have some kids flying a kite with a camera, you can take a picture uh, of a destroyed Bedouin village. As I said, this village has been bulldozed uh, to the ground uh, hundreds of times. The Bedouins just keep coming back. And of course, the simple photographing of what the Israelis do, bombing an urban center, uh, is an act of protest itself. I could talk at great length about Joe Sacco's work in Gaza, uh, his patient, detailed drawings of daily life, and particularly his sense of the way Gaza City itself is not only walled in, you cannot come and go from Gaza City or from Gaza itself inside the city as well. Very, very difficult to move. Uh, the Israelis impose an, uh, uh, multiple ways of keeping people confined. Okay. Uh, my own personal experience with this, because I go to uh, Israel and Palestine routinely, because I uh, go to Birzeit University, uh, because I have criticized the Israeli regime, um, I am uh, part of a group called uh, the, the uh, American Terrorists. Uh, I have blanked out, redacted the names of all the students. Up here, there were 18 students named because they uh, belong to uh, uh, a student group supporting Palestine. And here, there's a picture of one of my untenured colleagues. This, folks, is what tenure is for. Uh, and I'm very flattered by the picture. I think it makes me look better than I actually am. Uh, to my mind, it makes me look like Salman Rushdie. Uh, of course, uh, <laughs> as soon as uh, that portrait was splattered all over the University of Chicago campus, uh, we decided to make it the occasion for uh, a discussion at our Humanities Institute. <laughs> I see that time is running a little bit short. I'm out, I think I'm around 45 minutes now. So uh, I had hoped to talk about Tanya Bergera, uh, the great Cuban artist and her work. Uh, here's a performance of uh, police control of a crowd. Uh, but I just don't think I have time for that. Uh, if there re really were uh, time, I would talk about this demonstration in which she eats a pound of Cuban soil. Uh, so there would be uh, a lot of other things to talk about here, but I, I want to uh, just quickly go to the end and show you the protest, uh, the resistance that I'm involved in uh, right now. Let me uh, just go back quickly to the entire slide lecture. And see you for there yet. Okay. Um, the site of this this is a park right here in Chicago. It's a, a 
a few blocks from our house. It's a park that was designed by the great progressive and abolitionist activist, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. In 1871, Olmsted designed Central Park in New York, and he was the pioneer of what's called the Democratic Park, which was based on the old aristocratic landscape gardens of England, uh, some of which were imposed on Ireland as well. Uh, I know you've had great estates there. Olmsted studied the landscape gardens of the aristocratic estates in Europe, and he said, we need to have those for America, but there'll be one difference. They are not private, they are public, and any citizen, no matter how poor, can go to the park. And if they wanna sleep on a bench, you can't tell them to go away. This is the design. It was a very major thing. It was, uh, this is Jackson Park on Lake Michigan. This is the Midway Plaisance, who is, which is a boulevard, uh, four lane boulevard, completely planted with trees. And at the beginning, it was flooded. You can see Olmsted uh, had gondolas uh, that connected the two parks. So you could get on a gondola in Jackson Park and go all the way to Washington Park inland. Uh, incredibly beautiful parks. Uh, so what's to, uh, to worry about? Well, there's this. That blue sector there is the amount of space to be taken from Jackson Park and privatized for the glory of somebody who I care about and supported uh, throughout his presidency, namely Barack Obama. As you know, Obama comes from Hyde Park. That was, he got his start in Illinois politics uh, and Chicago. So what's in this space? Let me just give you a glimpse. Um, uh, here's a picture of one end of the park near what's called the Women's Garden. Uh, here's uh, another shot. Here's a bit that I, uh, I took this yesterday afternoon, just around sunset. Uh, here's a place we often go to. This is the Japanese garden uh, inside Jackson Park. Uh, when Obama's presidential center is built and they plan to break ground in October of this year, just a few months from now, uh, they will take, uh, it'll require about 20% of the green land area of Jackson Park. Uh, this gives you a sense of the whole system. These are some historic photos uh, of this landscape, which has been around since the 19th century. The World's Fair uh, uh, took place in the northern end of it here, and the Museum of Science and Industry was built here as a relic of the World's Fair. That is the one, and it's not a private building. I mean, it's a, a public museum and one of the favorite things for children to do uh, in Chicago. Here is a map of the Obama's initial plan. They wanted to take the entire end of the Midway and turn it into a parking lot. Uh, fortunately, the neighbors are in this adjacent building are very powerful. Uh, they have political connections, they stopped it. So it will go underground, a 400 car parking lot, below water table uh, in the, this park. Uh, let me just show you what those green spaces will be replaced by. Uh, we, one of the claims of the Obama Foundation is, oh, we'll replace all the trees. And you can see what the replacements look like. They will be saplings for the next half century. This is a view of uh, the main building. Uh, it was widely criticized as being pharaonic, uh, being a kind of, uh, with no windows, a stone obelisk. Uh, so the architects responded to public criticism by making it about 30% taller, 23 stories, which means that its shadow every day will loom over that Japanese garden I showed you a minute ago. You can see also that the claim is that this will improve the park and replace all the green space by planting things on the rooftops. Uh, the overhead view makes it look as if there's a lot of green space uh, but the closer you look, the clearer it becomes that is incredibly superficial. Uh, nothing can be planted there with any deep roots. So this is a shot from the apartment 
of uh, some neighbors of ours. And I can tell you the sector we're looking at basically begins uh, on its north end right here and goes over to here. This, this is Wooded Island over here. Uh, it will go along here and then, oops, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> this building here uh, will mark one terminus of it, uh, but it would go beyond that, clearly almost off to the horizon, 20 acres. And I forgot to mention the roads. This is a commuter artery which goes through the park. Could be improved, but it will disappear. And this major artery that links the whole south side of Chicago to downtown will be permanently eliminated, creating unbelievable traffic jams. So far, no one has figured out a way to stop this. Uh, and uh, the because it is Barack Obama, there's a feeling, oh, it must be righteous, it must be good, and, uh, and we support him. But the neighborhood is deeply divided. Uh, and that means the community. Uh, so I am an activist on one side of a community dispute. Here's my final slide. I, I want to, to sh I am trying to get our local paper to publish this as an image of what Jackson Park will look like uh, by December, when they have clear cut 1,000 mature trees excavated well below ground level in, into a swamp area very close to Lake Michigan. Uh, it'll resemble what the park looked like after the fire burned down uh, the Columbian Exhibition in 1894. Uh, so we have a preview of a previous disaster which was overcome. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Obama's center is going to be an, an act of overcoming. I would like to overcome it. But uh, let me stop there. And uh, I don't think I have to summarize. I would like to hear our respondents and, uh, and from the audience, uh, any thoughts you have on what I presented. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. And uh, as I said, I'll uh, move straight to the, to the respondent, and then hopefully we'll have time for for general questions. I, I remind everybody that uh, the function is the Q and A uh, there at the bottom of the screen. So whenever you uh, feel that you are ready to ask a question, please use that function. Uh, I'll move straight. To the two respondents for the day, uh, Al Putnam um, is lecturer in the Houston School of Film and Digital Media at NUI Galway and an internationally recognized digital artist. And Associate Professor Timothy Stott um, is uh, in Modern and Contemporary Art History at Trinity College Dublin. I suppose I'll pass the floor on to L to start with, and then L and team will decide who is going first. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. And thank you for a um, wonderful talk, Tom. Um, the concepts of art, community, and resistance are also um, vital topics in my own work and research. And uh, the challenges you described of describing them uh, resonated <laughs> a lot in my own work. So um, uh, Tim and I, we kind of said in the background, um, I'm gonna respond first and then he's gonna uh, respond. And, um, and uh, I think to start with in preparation um, for today, I found myself looking at a lot of images, uh, thinking about concepts of art, community and resistance and the ones that I kept thinking about were ones of January 6th. And actually a lot of the images that you showed were ones that I found myself looking at. And I think this moment uh, came to me over and over again as I thought about these terms, art, community, and resistance is because they are instances of a community resisting and using a kind of aesthetic in their practice, in their organization. Uh, they have their own iconography. They have their own symbolism of QAnon, the Bugaloo Boys. And it really became this manifestation of what Guillermo Gomez Pena uh, refers to as the mainstream bazaar. 
where performance art is really not just um, on the margins anymore, but as he described back in the early 21st century, and I read as I myself was a budding performance artist, um, realizing that MTV <laughs> is uh, doing a lot of the things that I thought were, you know, different. <laughs> uh, what is it, the, the show Jackass really is just performance art. <laughs> and um, so, it really coming to think about art resistance and community it's uh, you mentioned how resistance is not in itself you know it's not inherently you know good it's not something um that can be treated as a kind of solution and i think a lot the same as art where as an artist um you know art not just being an object but an action but an interaction but a kind of socially engaged gesture and it's it's not inherently um capable of bringing about, you know, the just future that I would hope it would bring and a lot of um, other artists, but uh, seeing, especially with January 6th and, and as you brought back to the Tea Party, I mean, there's a strong quality of performance throughout that and drawing through these symbols, these occupations of space, these acts of resistance. And, um, I, I was thinking as well as you were um, talking, well, first I just wanted to respond to the arts of resistance in Ireland and two immediate examples come to mind. So one is the artists campaign to repeal the eighth amendment, which formed, I believe in um, 2015 or 2016, um, but up until 2018 in the Irish constitution, um, there was a anti-choice, uh, anti-abortion clause that forbid abortion under all circumstances. And uh, artists were very involved in drawing attention to this and bringing about the movement of repealing. Uh, and finally in 2018, it was repealed through popular vote. And so they engaged with activism, uh, producing buttons, flyers, um, online petitions, but also artistic works, including uh, participation in 2018, AVA International and events in um, the Project Arts Center. Another example that comes to mind is the group Be Beyond in Belfast, which is a group of performance artists. And um, they're based in Belfast, but you know, throughout the country as well. And um, what happens is every month on a Saturday around noon, um, we occupy a space in Belfast, a public space and perform, improvise for about an hour, hour and a half. And uh, these are, you know, working with different objects, sounds, interaction, public space, but really challenging the implied uh, performances of these public spaces, which um, especially when they're taking place in parts of Belfast, you have that history of the troubles and the strong um, regulation of public space but more recently, it becomes a resistance to the neoliberal management of public spaces. The amount of times we've been asked to leave because um, our actions were not appropriate <laughs> for these spaces. So um, just thinking of some examples of the art of resistance here in Ireland, um, but then also responding to the point about community, I wanted to also talk about uh, digital communities. Uh, especially over the past year, where our, mean, our main means of communication has been through digital networks, including this webinar now. <laughs> um, and um, thinking about digital communities, also their role in organizing um, up to the election, um, organizing around QAnon, January 6th, um, and how um, I think also when I'm thinking about digital communities, uh, again, it's not an instance where it's not just about working towards a just future. So the media itself is not, and you know, it can be used in many ways. But I also think of Habermas's um, uh, fear of the kind of postmodern society that he articulates um, in response to Leotard. And I imagine Facebook being that kind of dystopian vision of postmodernism that. Um, he was describing where you have these kinds of bubbles of people who are interacting with each other, but not necessarily interacting with wider spheres. And just thinking about how information spreads in these contexts, but um, digital technologies can also be technologies of resistance for a more just future. And um, I'm thinking here of artists like Emilio Winger Bearskin, who is a US-based artist 
and she is um, uh, Iroquois of the Seneca Cuyahoga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan. And she uses um, these kinds of concepts and traditions of co-creation and decentralized storytelling that traces back to her indigenous heritage and uses this in her use of technologies. Um, so thinking about, for instance, how uh, storytelling takes place in a decentralized way through Twitch, through Minecraft, but also how can we create code that is more ethical and not only carries seven generations of the past, but also carries seven generations into the future. Uh, so countering or resisting that push of innovation that is really about this immediate present and short term um, benefit, but really looking into that longer term into the future. And um, she had done a project um, as part uh, in 2020 of this bigger project called the 2020 Awakening, where artists had presented billboards uh, across the United States. And she had two, uh, one that said, what is made bright by the loss of your light? And the other is who benefits from your burnout? And thinking a lot about, uh, she calls this piece, Take Care Friends, and thinking about um, her friends, especially her femme identifying friends and mothers who are very involved in uh, community work and the maintenance work um, that are not just important in making resistance possible, but a lot of times is unacknowledged. And really, especially in the pandemic, how, how you know, being asked over and over again to do the impossible. So um, I guess just to end, um, in the article that you had written and um, spoke about yesterday, uh, you talked about one of the differences of our current moment with the past is that we don't have that kind of revolution as a war. And I'm thinking a lot about revolution, um, not so much in, as these um, acts, like these acts of these moments, these drastic moments of change, but really that ongoing revolution of maintenance and care and what makes that possible. And thinking about how here we can use art to, uh, to build communities and also um, to engage with resistance towards that more just future. Thank you. If I had had time, uh, Elle, I would have uh, I talked about the global community and the work of Alan Sekula, uh, which uh, I think I, I mentioned uh, last time uh, and his uh, project called Ship of Fools which involved circumnavigating the globe and trying to revive uh, the old notion of a maritime community, the, the 19th century workers of the world who were, you know, the sailors were a huge part of it and the dock workers. So uh, Alan really regarded that as his community, the, the seafarers all over the planet. And of course, what is happening to the planet. So it's an incredibly, uh, flexible uh, concept, I think, which we need to think in terms of big scale and tiny scale both. So, Timothy, uh, love to hear from you now. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for a fascinating lecture. And also, of course, thank you to Paolo and the Moore Institute for inviting me. Just your last comment there, actually, this isn't in my notes, but it reminds me of even at the time of Dada, there was an understanding that the, the the community of sailors was this ideal cosmopolitan um, coming together of people from all parts of the world. You even find it to some extent in Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, this was an opportunity for me to actually go back and look again at I.O. Weitzman's work and Fiasca Gates' work. So in response, I'm just gonna make a few notes that are more or less obvious, um, that dig down perhaps into their own approach to what can be done with art, what an artist does, and how that relates to different forms of community building and resistance. I'll try to keep this as brief as possible because I know we want to leave time for questions. Um, so if you allow me, I'll just stick with my notes, otherwise I have a tendency to <laughs> go off somewhere else. Um, I guess first what we get with forensic architecture and gates is a change in artistic or architectural labor what it is that an artist or an architect does. Uh, both Gates and forensic architecture and Weitzman demonstrate this, but of course in different ways. Gates has developed this very complex, very extensive, very diverse social practice, of course, 
which repurposes materials, spaces, media, archives and collections, and of course buildings. There's this really interesting, I'm sure you were going to go into this, is this really interesting idea that in order to develop collectives, you first need to have the spaces in which collectives can gather. Different forms of collectives, different collectivities. And I think this shows that he's transforming his role as an artist from that of simply a maker to an organizer, a planner, and of course, and this is sometimes a dirty word in the art world, a manager, a manager of relations, a manager of projects. Um, He's even a capitalist. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> I was going to come to that, <laughs> um, which is another dirty word, of course. Um, and I'm, it just reminded me actually of some recent research by Gronje Cochran, she's just finished her PhD, which looks in great detail at this often neglected and often disavowed role of the artist as manager. Um, yet, of course, it's a crucial area of artistic activity and indeed artistic agency. I mean, the, the view being that if we cannot manage ourselves, then we will be managed. So it's this Foucauldian idea of not, how can I put it, not not being managed, but deciding how to manage yourself. Forensic architecture, of course, expand architecture architectural labor into investigative journalism, a form of activism, on the basis that architecture is often involved in a very violent form of politics. And you pointed to this with your last example, of course, around Jackson Park. Um, forensic architecture then as a means of kind of analyzing the present political moment through its spatial materialization, through the built environment. So two changes in labor, that's my first point. The one perhaps organizational, managerial, entrepreneurial, and the other, as you pointed out with this really helpful taxonomy, I think, well, the beginnings of the taxonomy, investigative, activist. And of course, this change in labor corresponds to a change in media. And I don't just mean the proliferation of media, kind of multimedia practice, which of course Gates exemplifies in many respects, but rather how we think about a medium. Gates notes that his own training in ceramics furnished him with a belief in his capacity, rightly or wrongly, to transform materials, obviously, but also to transform spaces. And of course, according to his belief, if you can transform spaces, then you can transform the collectivities that gather in those spaces. That these collectives are always, as he puts them, always a byproduct of a transformed space. Weizmann has this very interesting idea of architecture as what he calls a political plastic, by which he means that the built environment, buildings, but also infrastructure, is both the form and the medium of political and physical forces. And when he's talking about some of the work that he did in the early days of forensic architecture in Palestine, it's a very striking example that he uses of a bomb cloud um, as a transformed form of architecture. This is not the destruction of architecture. This is architecture in a different form. This is architecture transformed through physical and political forces. And then of course, this really, really interesting way of understanding how the built environment senses events, how it senses environmental interactions, that it's both built structures, of course, but it's also a media scale. And this became very evident in um, Perhaps the example that you're going to show, you already mentioned it, the killing or the forensic architecture investigation into the killing of the Reef Augustus in 2018. So buildings as political senses, I think this is a really, really interesting idea. And again, it shows the transformation of, of architecture as a medium. So what do both do? What do Gates and forensic architecture do? How does this transformation in labor and transformation in medium bear upon community and resistance? Well, I suppose forensic architecture provide tools. They provide evidence, of course, they provide what Weizmann calls forensic assemblages. But they provide tools, but they also provide a methodology to visualize events that are often at or beyond what he calls the threshold of detectability. It's kind of point where resolution and indeed memory breaks down. 
And they developed this software, of course, called Pattern, which allows activists and reporters and journalists or just community members to share and collate first-hand reports and recordings of particular events, violent events, using what they call the fast violence in comparison to the slow violence of architecture. This allows them then to uncover different types of violence across scales. And at one point he, he breaks it down into the violence at the scale of a person, the scale of a living body, of course, violence at the scale of a room, a city, an environment. And again, I think it's a really interesting point that you make at the very beginning around where do we draw the lines of the community? Because if the community is gathering around a particular violent event or violent episode, who is in where, again, that's a kind of boundary problem that I think is really, really interesting. It seems to me that forensic architecture perhaps bring a kind of community, perhaps we'd be better calling this a collective, bound by a shared experience of violence. I'm reminded here of, uh, long ago, Jacques Rancière's understanding of the demos, that the demos, in distinction to the polis, the demos is formed around the wrong, the feeling of an injustice, a shared injustice. Gates' relationship, perhaps community or collectivities, as he calls them, is, is also more direct, but also more complex, as I'm sure you know. I mean, this is a central element of his practice. And as you pointed out, he's also a capitalist. He starts by transforming himself into an enterprise. He even writes, you know, my body is capital, my brain is capital, my hands are capital, the things that I make with my hands are capital. But then, of course, I mean, he's, in this sense, he's a kind of very good social democrat because he uses this wealth generation to redistribute within the community. Um, again, to provide spaces for these collectivities. Although I think there's perhaps, and this is where I'll end, I think there's perhaps, and this is just a, a half-formed thought, but reading through the ways in which he describes the conversations that gatherings that take place in these different spaces. There's also some elements of what Jean-Luc Nancy called an, well, an inoperative community is how it's translated into English. I mean, in fact, the French désoeuvre is, is perhaps better translated as idle or out of work. Um, a community that's just based around sharing and generosity. He uses this, Gates uses this word a lot, generosity. Um, hospitality, communities that's not the product of work and it has no higher purpose than itself. And that, I suppose, is where I'll end it. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Timothy. Uh, it, so many things. Uh, it, it'd be lovely to uh, to discuss further. I wish I was there. This is this is the moment when now I want us to gather with the audience and hang out go to a pub and talk in, deep into the night uh, but the three of us have done a lot of talking if uh anybody else would like to say something ask a question um let's let's hear it um there is a complimentary um note from dana gavin um that is a fantastic thanks so much um uh, we're, welcome, we're glad Dan, that you that you enjoyed it very much so um if there aren't any questions uh you know one thing we have i have a lot more and maybe i could just mention some things that i didn't was not able to get to uh while people uh you know mull over whether they they have questions um the um, the Alan Sakula, uh, I, I mean, he was a great activist artist. I have uh, lots of pictures of his work, uh, and my my essay "Ship of Fools" is uh, about uh, his work in relation to the arrival of maritime space and a maritime community in the seventeenth century. Uh, 
as portrayed in an emblem book. Uh, it's a it's a huge argument in its own right, but, but I think it's it's part of this thing. I think we're all in noticing that we need to pay attention to scale, all the way from the single body to uh, the diaspora, uh, the uh, extended community of uh, of labor or identity, um, which may, often makes communities. Uh, go forward with hyphenated uh, self images, uh, images that are anything but simple, often divided against themselves. Um, the Obama phenomenon has often fascinated me since we actually uh, got to meet him a number of times before he was uh, the president of the United States. He was on my, he was a colleague here in the law school uh, and a resident at his house is uh, about a five minute walk from mine. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I have to admit, I uh, probably over idealized him. Uh, it's been uh, a kind of rude awakening to see the architectural violence that he's willing to exert on Jackson Park. Uh, and, and still a mystery to the community that loves him and supports him why he won't listen, why he, why he insists on doing this. They have been for five years involved in a legal uh, and critical discussion. And now they are finally gonna break, I, I'm a plaintiff in the lawsuit as well. I'm not just a sorehead writing letters to the editor, um, but it's getting very hard to get anything into the papers now because as we say in Chicago, it's a done deal. Uh, his director of publicity at the Obama Foundation, wonderful guy named Michael Strout Manis. When I had lunch with him, uh, I said, how can we get Barack and Michelle to listen, just to listen? Uh, and he said, oh, that, Tom, that ship has sailed. It's, it's, all, it's all done. So this air of inevitability has settled on our community. Yesterday, Janice and I went to uh, a meeting of the Midway Plaisance Council. Every little sector of Chicago has its group of concerned neighbors who protect it. And they opened with a discussion of the trees on the Midway, remember that long boulevard, and uh, how important they are. Uh, they had a tree ecologist who said, you know, these, how much oxygen they produce and shelter and amenities, psychological benefit. Uh, so question period came, I said, why isn't the Midway Plaisance concerned that right at that Eastern end of the Midway Plaisance, you're going to have 1000 historic trees cut down in three months. Why aren't we talking about that? And the answer pretty much was, it's a done deal. Nothing we can do about it. And I'm afraid that's, unless our lawsuit succeeds the newspapers won't take it up it's so i am uh, uh, in the middle of a lost cause i think that may jaundice my whole sense of art and resistance right now um that this is uh but then i always re remind myself of gramsci uh, how does it go optimism uh of the will pessimism of the mind the other uh a, a great example uh, that I never got to, um, let me just look at it for a second, is the, um, I'm, a, I'm a great lover of George Orwell and uh, his participation uh, in the, the Spanish Civil War and the attempt to create a republic in Spain, which was defeated. So you can see I sort of, uh, I have a taste for lost causes. The film of 1984 it has an opening image, which I have always been haunted by. This is the opening shot. Let me uh, share it. Um,
Okay, it, it, it is uh, right there and now. This is <laughs> the quietest, loneliest, most desperate act of resistance in Orwell, uh, the novel portrayed it. The, uh, the, the, the oppressive force that has to be resisted is of course what Guy Debord called uh, uh, spectacle, uh, but what Foucault would have called surveillance. There was a debate, I guess, between Debord and Foucault about which was worse, spectacle or surveillance. Uh, Big Brother combined the two. Uh, but the, uh, the act of writing and reading uh, is shown here. Uh, Winston Smith is huddled over his notebook, writing his, his private diary uh, out of view of the telescreen, he thinks. So he thinks he's evaded surveillance. Uh, and uh, so it's one part of resistance I think we must uh, maintain is the, the, the right to privacy, to not being invaded because the, the, uh, we all have data doubles now. The surveillance system is greater than ever. And somewhere between uh, this regime of spectacle and surveillance and the privacy and secrecy of the individual body is the public the commons, that's the contested area. Uh, it's where you are either anonymous or you're identified, uh, whether you're part of the masses or the commons, the, the public. Um, it, it's, uh, this was the opening shot of 1984, the film, which was made and released in 1984, uh, directed by Michael Radford. Uh, and it, uh, I think, beautifully portrayed the kind of scene of uh, spectacle and surveillance uh, as a world system uh, in which the face of the observer and, and the tyrant would hover over everything. So it's always haunted me as something we mustn't ever let go of uh, as a, a object of love and attention. So let me stop sharing and come back to the meeting. Dan, I think you, you have a question, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. Well, I really sort of comments and a few things that was really fascinating. There's so much to work with. I do, I, I like your Salman Rushdie comparison. Actually, it was terrific. Like iconography and iconology of your, your image. I can well imagine your pleasure in that, um, in the midst of also being, you know, singled out and targeted. Um, I was also struck when your comment, I didn't, I knew nothing of, I'm actually from Illinois, from Urbana actually, uh, but I, I knew nothing about what was going on with the, with the Obama development there, which I take it is, is that's near the, the Art Institute, is it just, I mean, it was in, in one of your images? Uh, no, it's uh, just south of the Museum of Science and Industry. Oh, the Art, is Art Institute is downtown. Okay. Uh, I didn't mention, by the way, I, I have often wondered whether uh, uh, Todd Williams and Billy Chen, the architects, it, whether there isn't an ethics of architecture. When mm -hmm. you look at a site and you tell the client, like a good doctor, you are doing major surgery on a site which is extremely delicate. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll be, uh, you know, will, is it their responsibility to warn the client? Uh, Mm -hmm. I would think so, especially when uh, about uh, one mile away at the western edge of Washington Park, uh, there is a whole, there are acres of vacant lots with, inhabited by nothing but a gas station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when the Obamas were studying the alternatives for sites on the south side, they had a consulting firm. Uh, consulting firm said Washington Park is the superior site. They didn't say it loud enough. They didn't say it. And so Barack and Michelle got this idea, well, but Jackson Park is pretty. Yeah. <laughs> it won't be pretty this yeah. fall. Uh, so I say you have, you're from Illinois, you haven't heard yeah. about it. Uh, half my neighbors uh, are, are oblivious to it. 
when I finally meet somebody, of course, then I bend their ear for a half hour like I'm doing now. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's our kind of immediate sense of what we thought was benevolent, benign, soft power mm. uh, coming uh, with, down with the fist on our own space. Yeah. Deeply regrettable. I mean, I, Chicago is, you know, the Mer America's greatest city for architecture, and maybe there's a kind of aspiration to make an imprint on it. I was thinking also of the, the French president's um, entitlement to create a monument to themselves after their presidencies and the Nouvelle Arche, for example, of Mitterrand um, reminded me of it. The two things I wanted to pick up on were to earlier in your su uh, suite of images. One was the of the... Um, the resistance, the, the 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 fists raised with the black glove in the 68 Olympics. And I was just interested in the striking, the head bowed, the dimension of the head bowed. So there's something quite striking. And as it happens, the white athlete looks forward without head bowed. So it's both the gesture of, of, of power, but also of, of a kind of humility. Um, it's also, again, the taking of the knee is is a gesture, I think, of respect. I mean, you genuflect, um, you know, those in that tradition as, as a, in effect as a mark of, <laughs> of respect and recognition. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was the interesting um, darkening of Colin Kaepernick in that image, um, who's a fair-skinned person, but it seemed to pick up on the Glenn Legon image, which is kind of interesting. And I don't know if, if Glenn Legon's image was also partly based on that of of the enforcement of, of race and racial difference uh, and the American kind of ideology and social practice. Um, and then I have some questions for, for Janice too. But anyway, I don't know if there was anything in that that you wanted to pick up on. Jan, you still there? Um, turn on your mic and join us. I'm here. <laughs> Um, my question for you, Jess, is really, I'm, I'm intrigued by the SNL um, yeah, okay. <laughs> relation. I would love to know more about that. But also, what could you say something about the instrument that you're playing in your image when you're not on screen? You have a, a surrogate image, and it, it looks quite interesting. It looks like a large, large, interesting flute sort of instrument that you're playing. But yeah. um, I'm just playing a C flute in this one. I'm, I'm not sure how that came across. It may be just the angle or my lack of familiarity, but uh... yeah, I'm, because when I've done performances at home and I'm angled away from the camera, the end of the flute looks larger. Right. Okay. I that was what I. Yeah. yeah. It looked like one of those enormous saxophones that. that you know, oh, <laughs> no, no, there is a sax, but not that. On the Saturday Night Live image, it's a March 2014, and it's called "What's Poppin." And you can find that or just Lena Dunham. But if you go to the uh, YouTube setting of the piece, uh, I have lots and lots of comments. I, I've accepted almost all of them, including people who said they got a brain tumor from my piece. <laughs> I get a lot of things. If someone was going to cut off his testicle. <laughs> so other people love it and they think it should be, you know, it's the greatest hip hop piece and, and lots of compliments and then amazing complaints and, and negatives. But um, the other thing is within that, then there's some talk about it being on What's Poppin' on Saturday Night Live. And a composer friend of mine has some things about how to find it. And then she has a whole paragraph on her blog about it. But it's March of 2014. Okay, I'm definitely okay. going to follow that up. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know, Tom, if you wanted to comment on any of my comments, or you may pass over them in <laughs> silence. With no, I, 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 I uh, had not thought about the inoperative community as, you know, among the um, my IVE uh, list. I will certainly add it. Thank you for that, Dan. It's a great, uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry, it was Tim, you, you suge suggested that. Uh, the, uh, it, because we have a lot of that in Chicago on the South side. Uh, the, the homeless population uh, is growing, needless to say. Uh, the, you know, on the commercial strips, you will, uh, I, I try to always carry a dollar or two to, to give some money, not just to walk by and ignore people. Uh, it's, uh, it, so there is, and one of the arguments for 
the privatization and uh, destruction of Jackson Park is that it'll keep the inoperative community out of there. Uh, some of the people, uh, I started a petition uh, which got 200 faculty signatures here. Immediately one of my colleagues in the sciences um, started a counter petition and she said uh, explicitly, uh, the, the reason we, we want the Obama Center in Jackson Park is to get those vagrants out, uh, out of there. We feel they're dangerous and uh, shouldn't be there. Um, Olmstead is one of my great heroes as far as thinking about art and community because the whole theory of Olmsted's uh, practice as a landscape architect was to deprivatize the beautiful Edenic space of the aristocratic landscape garden. Uh, and you, uh, you must have great gardens of this sort in Ireland, which are now what? National trust, na national property. Uh, and he said, and by the way, in your public in Central Park in any uh, landscape garden, uh, try to avoid large mansions because a mansion suggests that that's where the owner lives. And a person entering Central Park, Jackson Park must think I am the owner. Anyone, vagrant, uh, well off. So it was a radically democratic idea about architecture lands, uh, and landscape. And to, uh, I've been writing op-eds on democratic space and the idea of public space and how it gets harder and harder uh, to have a demonstration of any kind. Uh, you know, the spaces are controlled and, and limited. Olmsted was one of the, you know, the, the great heroes of opposing that. Uh, so, we could go, go on all, all day, guys. I'm happy to, to uh, keep talking. Any other uh, questions you want to? Want to um, very, very quickly, um, I was also uh, thinking about some of the remarks made by Tim in relation to the uh, collective space. And uh, I wanted to um, link that to the notion of uh, uh, space, uh, art as creating space. Yeah. Um, and in that context, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the reception and the impact that art, uh, and I'm especially thinking Palestine, has um, how it reached out to the community to create this space within which the community can find a place to, to talk, to engage, to become an active participant, not only of community space, but also of art uh, yeah. production. Yeah, that the idea of 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 creating space. I, I'm very much inspired by Hannah Arendt's uh, remarks about what she called the space of appearance, which she says is a fragile thing. It's it is not just physical. Uh, it it is uh, related to the idea of a public park or a public square, the plaza. Uh, but it's also she says incredibly fragile because it depends upon the gathering of the community to transform it from simply a physical space into a space of appearance where uh, a public appears and can see itself, uh, you know, because we're off in our own cubby holes and we don't see it. So uh, uh, a few years ago, I, um, I published a, a book on the Occupy movement uh, with uh, the anthropologist Michael Tausig and uh, uh, political scientist and law professor Bernard Harcourt, uh, in which we reflected on the Occupy movement as an attempt to uh, for uh, communities all across America to reoccupy public space, uh, to show up and to uh, turn them into camps. Remember, Occupy lasted in the United States. It started in Tahrir Square. And I have some slides of the of what happened in Tahrir Square, the way communities, very different kinds of communities gathered. It was incredible. It was not just an undifferentiated mob uh, or mass. Uh, uh, Muslims, Christians, uh, secular people, uh, political activists, 
it, it was a patchwork quilt occupying Tahrir Square. Uh, and Occupy was inspired by, by Tahrir Square. We need to do that in the US. So uh, Occupy Wall Street was the first one. They said, let's not go to the government. We, we want to go to the owners of space, to uh, the, the capital of capital. Uh, not Washington, D.C., but Wall Street. Uh, similar thing happened in Chicago. Uh, and uh, one occupation was led by uh, a, a group of senior citizens who uh, complained that that was too hard for them to sit down in the street, which was the, the uh, general way of doing it. So a, a lot of camp stools were brought out uh, so that they could sit in a street and occupy that street. Uh, as you know, it lasted a few months. And then uh, I think that was, uh, was that Mayor Bloomberg, the, the great emancipator who, uh, who drove them out with uh, uh, fire hoses. Uh, there, there was a public library, uh, a, uh, a doctor's booth uh, in, uh, on Wall Street on that, that block that they occupied tiny square very close to it. Um, they tried to make it a kind of operative community. And of course, the immediate thing that happened was the uh, all the inoperative communities of New York said, oh, that's where I'm going. They went there because they knew they would be welcome. They, they had free food. They had uh, a clothing giveaway. It was a little utopia of gathering. and regular performances, poetry readings, and the development of a um, uh, non-technological, non-electronic sound system uh, called Mic Check. Uh, I uh, wrote a poem about Occupy, a very bad poem, I'm not going to read it here, uh, but, it, but it was designed as a call and response poem where each line had to be shouted out and the people in the front row would sh shout it out and then the next row back and the next row back so that even at the end of the park people could hear it uh, really limits your um, uh, agility as a poet uh, because it takes you know uh, 15 20 seconds for each line to be repeated out to the uh, the edge of the space of occupation but that to me uh, it's something it was i thought it was such a beautiful moment fragile um but i uh i still cling to it even if my poem wasn't very good it was um it was basically a set of questions and answers you know why are we here and uh, then the answer to that uh, damned if i know <laughs> great to hear a crowd saying that thank you tom um i've got a question for janice actually uh, if i may um, um, the first thing that, that, that struck me as I, as I was watching your video, Janice, was uh, um, the different expressions. Um, uh, you're very uh, lively and animated, and, and the drama is opposite. It's got this very kind of neutral, stern face. Uh, is, is there, but perhaps uh, you would like to be somewhere else? I, I don't know. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about these kind of contrapositions of expressions, which, which actually return um, all the time that the camera really moves and, and focus on the drama? So um, I would like to, yes. <laughs> yeah, well. uh, yeah. Um, I have a lot of these kinds of pieces. I also have a piece called Amendment Blues Number no. One, which uh, references Occupy. And I do a kind of mic check thing within there. But um, basically, a lot of my characters come from the text. So the revolutionary is always angry and she doesn't have a sense of humor. And so she's raising her fist and she's walking in front of a graffiti wall. Um, the composer is much more kind of uh, centered in terms of rhetoric. And then the hip chick is just kind of cool and always speaks to a beat. Then there are other characters that I conceive of as clowns. And so it always goes, uh, the intensity goes through the text. And so um, the charlatan preacher is saying, um, just accept violence. It's all part of the greater plan to bring salvation to woman and man. So I really try to get into the expression of the text and that's how these characters are animated. All right. So the, the drummer is the composer 
represent the composer in the piece. Yes. This okay. is the composer's mind and then the composer's wow. milieu. Okay. Yes. I can even recite it. I compose what I am. I compose right. what I'm not. I compose when I'm cold. I compose when I'm hot. Uh, so right. I think I know it by heart, but I can't. An interesting thing in that particular part, you'll see I'm in front of the Art Institute and it's a Sunday. People are waiting to get online to see, I think it was uh, Tutankhamen or something like, it was something very bourgeois and kind of restricted artistically. And so then I'm there with a very limited crew and I'm doing, I compose and nobody came up. It's as if they looked at me as if I was really kind of crazy. And so the fine art was in one place and the performance was elsewhere. And it was an interesting separation. Mm, lovely, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we might bring it to a, a close, but before we do that, I have to uh, say that the board sessions have been recorded and they will be made available uh, through the uh, Moore Institute YouTube uh, channel so if uh, you have missed yesterday's, uh, you, can, you can go uh, to the Moore Institute webpage, uh, check out the YouTube and you can actually uh, see that again. And the same goes for, uh, for today's uh, uh, lecture and event. So uh, again, I'm, I really enjoy, I really enjoy both events. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Tom. And thank you, Janice, for being with us uh, today. Uh, again, to Tim and uh, Hal for their wonderful uh, responses. Uh, I hope it was very, uh, I hope it was um, interesting and uh, constructive for you as it was for me and for the audience. Um, so I'm looking forward to um, organizing these uh, uh, in-person uh, events uh, in the future so that we can revisit these uh, in, in as you said Tom it, at this stage it would be great to be in a room just have a have a glass of wine or whatever and uh, and start talking and keep on talking so um, all the best thank you uh, Dan thank you uh, David for looking after us and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch well, thank all of you. It's been uh, a wonderful two days. Uh, I just wish we could all uh, go out for a pint, uh, but next time. Next okay. time. <laughs> okay, all thank the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, ciao.